Today in the Todd Hartman Book Club, we're featuring The Inner Level by Richards Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. It's a new book. The subtitle is How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity, and Improve Everyone's Well-Being. This is in Chapter 6, The Misconception of Meritocracy, page 161. Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London who became Foreign Secretary in Theresa May's conservative government in 2016, was educated at Eton and Oxford. Given, giving the Margaret Thatcher lecture to a think tank in 2013, he articulated the view that economic equality will never be possible because some people are simply too stupid to catch up with the rest of society. Quote, whatever you may think of the value of IQ tests, it is surely relevant to a conversation about equality that as many as 16% of our species have an IQ below 85, he said. Comparing society to a box of cornflakes, he praised inequality for creating the conditions under which the brightest triumph. Quote, the harder you shake the pack, the easier it will be for some cornflakes to get to the top, end quote. Inequality, quote, is essential for the spirit of envy and keeping up with the Joneses that is, like greed, a valuable spur to economic activity. Whether or not Johnson is quite as clever a cornflake as he presumably likes to think, he certainly is not in command of the facts. Nobel Prize winning economists, as well as the OECD and IMF, have shown how inequality, far from spurring on economic growth, leads to stagnation and instability. Social mobility is reduced where income inequality is greatest and far from inspiring innovation. It turns out that there are actually slightly more patents granted per head uh, of population in more equal countries. And as we've seen in the previous chapters, there's also the undeniable human cost of our fixation with keeping up with the Joneses. But Boris is far from alone in his misconceptions about the relationships between inequality and ability. The idea that people are naturally endowed with differences in ability, intelligence, or talent, and that those differences then determine how far up the social ladder they reach is a powerful popular justification for social hierarchy. The presumption is that we live in a meritocracy in which the key to status is ability. We think of society as shaped like a pyramid. The supposition is that most people are near the bottom or only a little above it because the bulk of the population lack the special talents that we imagine people need to get to the top. The belief that differences in ability are the main influence on where people end up on the social ladder is so strong that we tend to judge everyone's personal worth, ability, and intelligence by their position in society. Nor is this confined simply to how we judge others. It also affects how people see themselves. Those at the top often believe that they're there because they are naturally endowed with plenty of the right stuff, just as many of those near the bottom think that their low status reflects a lack of ability. That picture, however, is not supported by the latest scientific evidence. First, research now shows that a very major part of what happens to people and where they end up is the result of totally unpredictable influences and occurrences amounting to pure luck. Second, aside from luck, the most important links that exist between ability and status operate in the opposite direction of that imagined by most people. Rather than different endowments of talents determining position in the hierarchy, it's much nearer the truth to say that position in the hierarchy determines abilities, interests, and talents. But let's address luck first. Whether or not we consider ourselves successful, most of us can probably look back across our own life histories and recognize the roles that luck and chance have played in getting us to where we are. We are per we're perhaps lucky with schools or teachers, with the questions on an important exam, with some nameless person dealing with university applications, or we got on well with an interviewer when applying for a job. Perhaps a chance meeting was important, or perhaps an opportunity for promotion came up unexpectedly. Finding a life partner is just as important for our quality of life as our career or income, but we are far happier to acknowledge that chance and luck played a key role in meeting that person than we are in acknowledging luck's role in our career. No one minds mentioning the chance meeting, the circumstances that put you both at ease with each other, or the shared interest that might easily have gone unrecognized. The role of chance makes people's lives highly unpredictable. Although there are huge social class biases and social mobility, there are, the same, there are at the same time vast numbers of people moving up or down the social ladder in ways that even the most detailed analysis of parenting and ability fail to, fail to predict. Similarly, although there are differences of perhaps 10 years in the average life expectancy of upper and lower social classes, that explains very little of the individual differences in how long people live. 
Inevitably, some rich people will die young and some people live in poverty to a great age. And as some public health mavericks used to say, even if you exercised, ate healthy, and didn't smoke, your most likely cause of death was still heart disease. In addition to all this, there may be a large element of chance in whatever our experiences, including subjective experiences, trigger the kind of epigenetic changes affecting subsequent develop development that we discussed in the last chapter. Just as the development of weather systems is sometimes said to be so chaotic it can be changed by the flapping of a butterfly's wings, so what amounts to chance events at the social or the cellular level are now thought to play a very substantial part in our lives. So much so, the scientists have worried that if random chance and luck are such important determinants of whether or not an individual becomes sick, gets good exam results, or has a good marriage, it becomes difficult to understand causal pathways at all and to do anything about preventing or re remedying bad outcomes. The book, The Inner Level by Wilkinson and Pickett.